Philippe Selbo. Uh, back to English now. Uh, for the next session about sustainability priorities in the changing global context, um, I call uh, Jacques Aschenbrock, Chair Valeo, Cécile Cabanis, uh, CEO uh, TKO Capital, Thierry Deo, CEO Meridian, and Alexander Stevens, CEO uh, Greenomy. Well, uh, we, we have the chance to have uh, uh, different, uh, different parties uh, concerned by our subjects, the, the chair of a big corporate company, uh, two uh, asset managers, uh, asset management company, and uh, Meridiam, which is uh, more dedicated to infrastructure uh, management, and uh, the CEO of, uh, let's say, a high-growing company, uh, dedicated in the sector, so it will be uh, more than interesting to, to, to hear and to share your different views. Uh, may, I, may I start with Jacques Aschenbrock uh, as the chair of Valeo. Um, we, we have been very impressed uh, uh, by doing uh, this, uh, this survey with Yves Perrier. We have uh, interviewed more than 200 CEOs all around the world. Uh, by uh, the importance and what is already engaged by uh, the corporates, uh, mainly in Europe, more than in the States. Um, and uh, the way um, Yves Perrier is talking about the industrial revolution, which is on its way uh, concerning uh, the, the way the corporates uh, are taking uh, the subject of the sustainability and uh, more specifically uh, the neutrality carbon 2050. Uh, can, you, can you tell us about your experience in the automobile industry uh, on this subject and what you, what you are doing? I think really that what you said is true. Uh, the automotive industry is an absolute revolution. Not only because uh, there are some new norms, and uh, you have heard uh, the norms in the, in the last regulation from the European uh, body that uh, the uh, traditional internal combustion engine should disappear in 2035, but because a lot of investment have already been put in place, uh, the industry in China, in Europe, in the US has been investing billions of uh, euro or billions of dollars to really engage that revolution. It's for truth, it's a real uh, movement. And uh, as a company, uh, we are, of course, totally uh, involved in that. We have spent a uh, few billions in uh, R&D and in uh, CapEx to be part of that revolution. We are probably the number one worldwide in electrification, both uh, in motors and in power electronic. But now we have to make those uh, investments profitable. And there is something that uh, maybe, if I may, uh, I, I want to, to stress. One is that taxonomy is not a perfect tool. If you totally respect the rules of the taxonomy, we have around 11% of our sales, which is linked to electrification. Why? Only because the products we are delivering to our customers are not counted as ours, but are counted as our customers, because they are using them for decarbonization. So for us, we have spent billions of dollars, but it's just exactly the same if we are producing some stones and not some products, which are the only product that can allow our, product, our customers to really decarbonize their own car. So that is a real problem. The second problem is uh, the... Uh, uh, the carbon bond adjustment mechanism. It's clear that uh, Europe is at the forefront, and uh, I'm very happy with that. But we have to pay a lot of attention that uh, the, uh, uh, the European industry and uh, its survival is not at stake. The way the uh, carbon adjustment will be done is absolutely key. If it is a way only to tax the uh, raw material, we are dead. Uh, use that word, we are dead. Because 
will never be competitive in Europe against producers in China, in Southeast Asia, or in the US. The carbon adjustment has to go very deep in details for what is really uh, the carbon content of the full product, which is extremely difficult uh, to do. So the way the carbon adjustment will be done is absolutely key for the five, uh, survival of the industry. And then concerning the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the carbon evolution, the famous scope one, scope two, scope three, the upstream and downstream, scope one and scope two is very easy to solve. The scope three, the upstream, is extremely difficult because you have to look at very much in details of the carbon content of all your suppliers, all the chain of your suppliers. And the downstream is, for us, what I mentioned, the fact that our products are the only way for our customers to decarbonize their own production. So we are in an extremely complex evolution, and I totally agree with the word revolution. But as European companies, we should be proud of what Europe is doing, but we have to pay a lot of attention of the uh, evolution and the competitiveness of our industry in Europe. Thank you very much, very precise uh, comments. Uh, may I ask you just uh, a question? We will come back uh, after on the second round uh, in uh, your analysis. But uh, what about the taxonomy? Uh, if Perrier has uh, um, many times uh, underlined that uh, the problem of the European taxonomy, environmental taxonomy, is to uh, give the priority to uh, oriented investments towards assets already uh, green, uh, he is using the example of Tesla. Uh, the question is not to invest in Tesla. The question is to invest in Volkswagen or Stellantis, which have a big investment to do to, 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 to make the energy transition and go to the electrification. Uh, do, you have, uh, do you share this, uh, this view? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. We started the revolution for very well, 10 years ago and uh, massively a few years ago. And it's a revolution that will last in the 10 to 20 years to come. So if uh, the taxonomy is only meant to uh, uh, find another company that already did a good job, all the rest will die, and uh, that's not the purpose. So obviously, we are in a revolution. The uh, taxonomy is, not, is done to, uh, to select those companies that are doing the efforts. But when I look at what is happening uh, in Europe or in different parts of the world, really a lot of companies are investing a lot to uh, really transform their own uh, production means and uh, their own pro uh, products mix in order to, uh, to move into that direction. Therefore, I totally agree with the revolution. The revolution is not done overnight. It takes time. Yes. <laughs> Cecile, um, uh, as a TKO, as deputy CEO of TKO Capital uh, International Asset Management Company, what is uh, your strategy? What are your, your main uh, uh, initiatives in terms of sustainable finance uh, in your strategy of investor? Yeah, so I think uh, it's true that we've been uh, hearing a lot about uh, taxonomy indexes, and I think everything has become very complex. Uh, and in the end, if we want to simplify, it's really to say that uh, if we want growth to be sustainable, it needs to be profitable. And if we want growth to be profitable, it needs to be sustainable. So as a first foundation, we make sure that in everything we look for our portfolio, we are treating extra financial and financial criteria at the same level. And we have our own uh, analysis uh, grid to make sure that uh, we are looking at uh, things that are relevant to the sectors or to the maturity of the company and so on. And to do that, we have fully integrated the ESG team with the business team because the, the issue that we still have is, in many instances, the ESG team is a bit uh, somewhere in the corporate and not really uh, grounded in the business. And, and it's the same for people writing the index. So maybe a, a train, a, a <laughs> an internship in company could be a good idea, but uh, that's for later. And, and when, when you've done that, it's really about license to operate. Because one day, if you are not uh, at a minimum required level, either you will lose your clients or you will not be able to hire or you will lose your uh, shareholders. So everyone will have one day to, uh, to make sure it's compliant. But today the problem we have is that even if we do that, 
it's not going uh, quickly enough because we have 3,000 days to reduce by 55% uh, our carbon emission. And, and, and the problem we have is that we have asked the companies to change, but we have not uh, really transformed the, the software, the way we operate, uh, the way we look at performance, because we are not measuring uh, in Excel uh, the, 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 the cost and value of externalities, because we are still assessing companies on short term while transition is long term. But then, if you are short term, you can only look at the cost because the transition is taking time. So before you get the return on investment, you need to have patient capital and patient investors that are able to, uh, to follow the company. And so we are in a triangle of inaction where everyone is looking at each other, so uh, public, uh, private, and citizens, and we need to escape that. And at TKO Capital, uh, because we've been uh, funded uh, in 2004 by two entrepreneurs and 18 years later we have under 35 uh, uh, billion of, uh, of assets under management, uh, four asset classes, uh, 13 countries and uh, 700 people. Because there is this real uh, entrepreneur mindset and we have no legacy, it's been always the case that we were focusing on what's going to come and on how we anticipate the future on the trend. So maybe to simplify, in order to, to break the barriers, we set up uh, an impact platform where the way we do it is we go for the full supply chain. We go in many instances with partners, with corporate as partners. So we have an energy transition fund with uh, Total Energy. Uh, we have just started uh, a regenerative agriculture fund with Unilever. So instead of having the fragmented supply chain, and as you said, Scope 3 is very tough to, uh, to manage because uh, who is paying for what? And, and, and uh, if, you, if you manage your supplier, you also manage the supplier of others. So it's really how you kill the barriers. You reconcile the time horizon because you decide about the, the time horizon of your fund. You decide about your intentionality. So on energy transition, it's really energy efficiency, uh, penetration of renewables, and uh, low carbon mobility. So your outputs are simple because you set uh, simple objectives. And when it comes to regenerative agriculture, it's very urgent, it's complex. But let's remind everyone that 95% of the food needs come from soil. So we need to regenerate the soil also because it's a, it's a carbon sink. And if we want net zero, we cannot just decrease the emission. We need to find a way to, uh, uh, to sequester uh, carbon. So this is the way we work. I think it's a collective game. There's not the bad guys and the good guys. We, we are all responsible of the system as it is today. So we all need to break the barriers and create the solutions in order to accelerate and put it at stake. And that's really what we're trying to do. And there is also a topic with the current context uh, about reindustrialization and deglobalization. So we are now starting also uh, a, a strategy on how we reindustrialize uh, Europe uh, with digitalization and so on. But I think it, what, what I don't like of uh, what I heard before is it seems that we expect that the taxonomy and the measurement will solve, but I think it will take a long time. So I think we need, it's, it's as everything. Let's not wait, it will be too late. Let's really act with what we can, and, and each of us with our job, and our job is to create a solution to allocate capital and to sustain economy and push the, the change. So. I know that you are a sailing woman. Uh, what is your answer to the people who say today, uh, after the guerre, the Ukraine war, uh, we, 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 we will not be able to keep the same objectives uh, for the future? But I think we were already not on the right trajectory, so we were already uh, needing to accelerate. For me, it's really, I think the objective is very clear. And yes, short term, uh, the winter will be cold, there will be bump on the road, and we will have to readjust the trajectory 
but we need to really keep our eye on the compass and on the, the objective in order to, uh, uh, to make it happen. But it won't be a walk in the park, for sure. You mean you are a good sailing woman. <laughs> Thierry, um, you are a CEO of Meridiam. Um, you are also the chairman of uh, Finance for Tomorrow. Um, first, concerning Meridiam as a, uh, an infrastructure fund, uh, how uh, do you consider the question of the sustainability? And uh, can you tell us a few words about uh, the Fast Infra project? <coughs> That's a lot of topics to treat in, <laughs> in five seconds, but um, I, I mean, I, I think to to make it uh, very simple, I mean, as Meridium, uh, I think the 20 billion that we have in the management are actually driven towards sustainability. And, and I think um, beyond uh, all the debates, it's all about just doing it rather than talking too much about it. I think we've had uh, carbon Uh, accounting available for nearly 15 years now. We have uh, methodologies that can do it. So what we've decided to do quite a number of years ago was to finalize a methodology with other <coughs> partners like AFD and others to actually be able to uh, calculate the temperature of our portfolios. But since we believe that um, the transition of the revolution is a systemic issue, it's not a climate carbon issue only. There's, there's climate, there's carbon, there is uh, adaptation, there is mitigation, there's also, and those touch things uh, like biodiversity and social issues, and they cannot be uh, separately uh, addressed because they are all related, unfortunately. Uh, and, and so, I mean, we, the good example or the bad example is increasing the carbon tax on fuel and having the gilet jaune, okay? So, so, so if you don't think about all these issues altogether, not that they are solvable altogether, but they are interrelated. So it's quite important to have this holistic view and include those in your processes that you don't have separate people doing sustainability versus investment. So they are both doing the same and having clear targets and goals in terms of uh, your trajectory, what you want to be aligned with 1.5 degrees, or if you can't make it, it has to be very clear that you can't make it, but, uh, and, and avoid the sort of stranded asset that uh, are the real risk issue in, uh, in there. So, I mean, in this particular uh, concept, I think to scale up the industry Uh, in particular in, um, in the infrastructure uh, sector, I think the idea of Fast and Fra was uh, to, to try to label uh, and to make it easier for big volumes and for asset management and investors to invest in sustainable projects to, to create a label that would uh, support this scaling up. Because at, at the end of the day, everything is there, but unfortunately, there's a lot of work to be done because it's complex, as uh, Jacques just said. Um, but, but it's not impossible. So we need to, I think the role of uh, this uh, type of uh, meetings and the role of the associations of Paris Europlas and what we try to do at Finance for Tomorrow as well is to simplify things, to have people converge I think uh, we are talking about data. There's plenty of data. It's just that we're incapable of using them because we somebody need to treat them, simplify, uh, and standardize to a certain extent so they are usable uh, for for everyone for to make investment decisions, but also for companies to make their own investment decisions and 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 transition. Thank you. We'll come back to finance for tomorrow. Um, before uh, Alexander. Uh, what is uh, your company? What are you doing as Greenomi? Okay, so um, sustainable finance regulation has uh, really inflated. You have new taxonomy, SFDR, CSRD. You have now 25 countries around the world adopting their own taxonomies. It's quite complex, I heard it. Complexity it will take a long time. Does it help for the transition? So the focus of Greenomi is to really focus on digitalization. How can we solve this with tech? So for example, issuers, multinationals have thousands of entities that need to submit the data, they need to consolidate it, they need to adapt their ERP systems. 
generate the reports and share with the financial sector. On the other side, asset managers will complain that they only have proxies, estimates, they don't have the report data from the issuers. You're going to have credit institutions that have to screen their entire loan book and will have to do the due diligence with every single counterparty. So it's significant costs, reporting costs. It's been estimated that it will cost the European Union 2.5 billion euros uh, over the next five years. Um, there's 49,000 issuers that corporates have to do this and 3,000 financial players in Europe alone. So our focus is, uh, we've spoken to 600 players last year alone across Europe, is that we've codified all of this legislation and we provide solutions to corporates, banks and asset managers to connect to each other, generate this data, share it, and make the analysis to enable the, tr the transition. But we don't do it on our own. Um, um, very recently in January, Euroclear entered into our capital and we're now building a user committee of several major financial players across Europe to together use this infrastructure and collect the data and exchange it. So you do not have to bother corporates multiple times. And banks, another bank that has requested data from the same corporate will have access to it. So it's an entire open ecosystem for all to work together. And this mutualization is, is key here in Europe, but also abroad. Um, we are speaking with other uh, authorities across uh, Europe and in the world. Tomorrow I'm going to the London where we're part of the FCA sandbox and our goal is to codify the UK taxonomy and create this interoperability. Now uh, it is indeed uh, a fast-growing uh, platform. We have now 10 banks connected to it but it all started here in Paris thanks to Finance for Tomorrow. Two years ago at Climate Finance Day we, we got an award as an international fintech and that was in our very early days. So. My personal thanks to Paris Oplas and the French ecosystem to support us. We're based in Brussels, but we have several representatives here in Paris and all across Europe. There is absolutely no link with your participation today, <laughs> but congratulations. Um, Thierry, I come back on, on the other way. Um, I don't know if you want to say a, a, a small word on the Fast Infra, but if not, um, uh, can you tell us uh, about uh, Finance for Tomorrow? Uh, how do you see uh, the importance of the subject of the impact finance of the biodiversity? You have heard uh, uh, Yves Perrier. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the observatory of the sustainable finance, which is uh, an instrument important to uh, follow and to uh, accompany the way the financial center is progressing on the trajectory? Now, as I was saying earlier, I think it's it's important to have this uh, holistic view of the transformation of the economy. Um, unfortunately, it creates complexity, but we we can't avoid it. So, so finance for tomorrow has been focusing on all the pillars uh, that constitute this or can enable this transformation. Uh, when it comes to uh, carbon, uh, since uh, there are already quite a number of tools, the idea was to uh, bring the financial place with the observatory to focus, uh, to standardize their commitment and to, uh, uh, to be able to communicate on their achievement and define a trajectory. Uh, this is uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, this is actually not a finance for tomorrow only project because it's a, a EU funded project which is led by uh, uh, the ministry and by ADEM uh, and we get a lot of funding for this to, to be able to show and this is really answering to this article 2 of the uh, Paris Agreement about the transformation of the financial places and showing that we're shifting the trillions towards basically sustainable finance becoming mainstream and I think that's that's the the big goal uh, in 10 years we shouldn't be talking about sustainable finance anymore but but only of finance uh, so that's one pillar and and I think the the two or three other pillars that that have been important the impact finance which has been also a niche uh, in in many ways very much linked to uh, um, philanthropy foundations uh, and with the uh, with the support of Olivia Grégoire, uh, where she was a, a minister, we've we've actually uh, managed to get the whole Paris Place beyond the 
ecosystem of Paris Europlast, but with also some of the pioneers of impact finance, and they were not the most, the easiest one to convince, <laughs> to come around a, a, a definition, methodologies to qualify impact in a way that it makes it scalable, uh, because I think it's very important not to be a purist to a point where uh, impact finance represent only a few billions, but uh, hundreds of billions. And, and, and the idea of not opposing, which was the biggest uh, hurdle in this discussion, not opposing profit and impact was uh, a, a big battle that I think we sort of now managed to uh, pacify, at least uh, uh, one way or another. Uh, and and the, the other important uh, uh, topic uh, since uh, the president actually uh, sort of uh, committed uh, by uh, engaging in the TNFD uh, to biodiversity is also, this is a very complex project because it's very difficult to, uh, to measure and there are today uh, very few people that have been uh, very active and capable of scientifically discuss it. Uh, I mean, we can see the disasters, but we don't know how to avoid it and do better. Uh, and, and I think we have to be aware of that. And, and so the biodiversity, and there was actually just recently a, a, a good forum with Patrick Pouyanné and uh, EPE, the Entreprise pour l'Environnement, really trying to focus with the companies on how you contribute uh, to that. I see people shaking their heads. Uh, we can always do better, but uh, we just have to try. <laughs> uh, that's because I mentioned Patrick Pouyanné, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so, so, so these sort of the, the three uh, major important, I mean, around that, obviously, uh, scaling the skills. I mean, the financial place needs skills that are able to understand these issues. Uh, I think we started a few years ago with the AMF, with Robert Ophel, uh, really putting uh, uh, sustainable finance as a part of the AMF certification. But uh, the work being done today with the universities and schools and business schools to, to actually spread the world at a level where we can get the skills. Uh, but it's true everywhere, also for the engineers uh, that are going into the companies. Uh, they need to understand these, these topics when they, their own training doesn't count it. So amongst, I, I guess these are the sort of uh, major ones. But the idea is to scale, to take this to the level of becoming uh, mainstream, uh, but it, it can only work if uh, the group of uh, people representing the, the, the Paris Europlace and the, the, the financial place really get together to converge. Because at the end of the day, um, there's always a lot of enthusiasm for the newly converted, and I welcome that. But at the end of the day, it's about doing it. Uh, yeah. it's, if everybody just starts uh, implementing, I think we will be stronger. Yeah, mainstream is absolutely key uh, in our view. Uh, Cecile, um, um, ESG, uh, you also have heard uh, possibly uh, Yves Perrier who was saying that uh, something complex. How do you consider ESG uh, management uh, in TKO? Yeah, maybe uh, before I answer, uh, one one point that I think is very important and we don't talk about it so much is acquisition of knowledge and training. Because we live in a world where you have a lot of uh, social network communities and where at the end the acquisition of knowledge is not anymore part of what you should do based on fact to really understand the topics. And I think it should be really mandatory for everyone coming around this topic uh, to uh, really get the knowledge based on fact, uh, having read the Jack and, uh, and so on, because today there is a lot of uh, kind of altitude discussion uh, without really uh, having a, a, a great knowledge of the fact. In, in regenerative agriculture, we are tackling biodiversity, and for that we look at science, we look at the cycle of nature, we look at uh, what the plants are able to do, but you need to go into details and you need to have uh, uh, re really the knowledge, and I don't think even in school and university and high school, 
they are doing some things, but I think they, they, they should go uh, even deeper because it's a, a direction that uh, we will not be able to uh, escape. On ESG, um, overall, that's what I, uh, I said. I think the, because I've, I've been in, uh, in corporate before, and what I've witnessed with ESG indexes and complexity is that you had to hire many people doing only reporting. And the problem of the uh, indexes and data you were reporting, uh, they were based on different methodology. They were not comparable and there was no materiality. So at the end of the day, it's not data that are actionable for the management to take decision, it's really data to report, to reassure or not uh, people that they control the system. But it's an illusion of control. And I think we need to be, uh, to be very careful in the way we use and the way we build uh, ESG data. So for us, it's clear that it's what I said at the beginning. Uh, and, and it's what you said, Thierry, it's, it's now anything linked to ESG data need to be taken into account at the same level as financial data and ESG team need to be integrated in business team to uh, make sure there's upskilling and one day we manage uh, without them. And for us, we have built our proper uh, grid to make sure that uh, it's relevant and meaningful versus the size of uh, companies that uh, we are investing in versus the type of sectors, because it's not one size fits all. And you need to take the, the starting point, but it's what we said around taxonomy. It's not about green becoming greener. It's about everything, tra everyone transforming, starting with uh, where it is today, so. Thank you very much. Um, Jacques, um, roadmap, instruments, uh, scope free. Um, how, do, how do you, what is your opinion on the 24 recommendations of the Perrier report? <coughs> I will not speak about the 24 recommendations. I speak about something I know much better is the value. Only to measure what we, mean by CO2 emission is an enormous complexity. It took us a few years. And if for you to have some figures in mind, we produce 8 million parts a day, having 2 billion of components entering our plant every day in 184 plants in 33 countries. And the fact that before giving you a goal and we committed ourselves to reduce, compared to 2020, uh, up to 2030, 45% our emission, you have to be extremely precise in how you measure it. Now take a decision of Germany that is having some problems with gas and reopening some coal plants. What does it mean for us? Short term, uh, enormous change, enormous change in uh, our measurement, and probably this year we will not reach our target for 2022, not because of us, but because of some of our suppliers having some electricity, which is not anymore based on gas, but based on coal, because of the situation in Ukraine. So when I hear uh, Cecile and Thierry speaking about a kind of generalization of what is happening, and when I look at how difficult it is when we have all the uh, steering wheels in hands to really be sure that what we disclosed is as close as possible uh, to the reality and given us some uh, uh, yearly targets and some 10 years target in order to reduce our CO2 emission, which is based on the variable remuneration of thousands of our managers, it's extremely complex. So I admire what both of you are doing from a very specific company up to kind of generalization. It's an incredibly difficult uh, task. So let's be sure that each one of the company on your portfolio makes the job properly. And what they disclose is not done to be disclosed to investors or to agencies, 
but is used as a tool to improve. Because from that tool, you are going to change your product definition, you are going to change the material you are using. So it's going very, very deep into the R&D, going extremely deep into the overall logistic. And like I said in my introduction, in a situation where you have to make sure that in Europe, we remain competitive. So it's, it's extraordinarily complex, even at the level of one company, before looking at a proper study and answer your question uh, concerning the 24 proposals of, uh, of Yves Perrier, which I think are very interesting. But I, I wanted to make sure that you understand how difficult, how, how much work each one of the companies are to put in place and reporting, internal reporting, what we disclose to you, is driven from our internal reporting in order to make sure that we understand what we're doing and we based our mid-term and long-term policy based on data. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I just had a, to be honest with you, your 45% reduction is a very ambitious target. I myself advise company to have alignment target versus absolute emission reduction because alignment allow you to take into account your context because you may be producing in countries that have totally different goals in terms of transition. Uh, so so it, it is something that today, I mean, we have this discussion amongst the G funds where everybody says, oh, I'll reduce. And then when they look at it, they say, oh, actually, I can't do this, so I will do it on 10% of my AUM, so which is ridiculous at the end of the day. So. I think the, the, the emission reduction is the most extreme commitment that you can make, but it's too late for you. I don't know, we have done it, so we'll do it. <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, clearly we have worked a few years before making sure that we understand and we know what we are emitting. It's not done overnight, it's an enormous job. No, no, it takes three years. Sorry, I did not answer your question. No, but, no, that's, uh, that, that's okay. But I, I, don't just, worry, I've read the proposals, so they're extremely good, no problem about that. Just a, a last question, which is going further in exactly what you were saying, but we were talking very much about the roadmap uh, for the corporates that we have met uh, doing this survey. And uh, the question of the roadmap is, uh, what, what, is uh, what is the term? We have a short term, we have a mid term, we have a long term. Uh, how a company uh, can manage uh, these uh, different dimensions. We know that uh, the, the decisions by the governments in the energy sector are long-term, 50 years decisions. Wh how is doing a corporate company? No, first, uh, it's absolutely impossible to reach any kind of goal if we don't have green energy uh, in, uh, available. Uh, the goal we have taken, we are using for, uh, in 2020, we're using only a few percent of green energy and to be able to reach our targets, we need to have around 75 to 80% of green energy. If we don't have the green energy, it's absolutely not reachable. Uh, and then, uh, I don't believe when you say, uh, it's not a criticism to our countries or Europe, but for a corporate, a goal being uh, uh, carbon neutral in 2050 is a joke. You have to give yourself, and therefore Thierry, uh, not totally agree with what you said, but we have to, maybe 45 percent is too ambitious. But we have to give us goal at 10 years. And well, uh, I wasn't saying the 45 percent was. It's the fact that you want to act only on your emission without looking at the context. But it's a no, more no, no, complex. It's okay. no, no, but therefore I mentioned that our products are part of our uh, emission reduction. But you have to give yourself some. Targets, probably 10 years target is important, but yearly target, uh, and to be sure that you align all your managers. If you don't align the people, if they are not totally committed in every plant, in every R&D center, the, and purchasing organization, that is important target. You'll never achieve anything. So we have to align thousands of managers to make sure that the, that is part of their DNA. I think it has become part of our DNA. And what is important is what we do in the, in the scope three with our own suppliers. Our customers are starting to do the same with us. So even if we didn't want to do anything, the judgment from our customers and in automotive business, in our company, we have 10 customers. So if one of them say uh, what you're doing is not aligned with what we want, then we're out. 
So it's extremely important what the financial work is do world is doing, of course, but it's extremely important what our customers are doing, the way they are going, and what we are doing with our own suppliers, and we have thousands of suppliers, that will be on top of what the financial world is doing, the way of moving uh, in the, into the right direction. Thank you very much. It's time to conclude. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, we, we have uh, no, no, no more time. Uh, just to underline uh, how necessary in our view is the, the dialogue between investors, uh, which are very involved, and corporates, which are on the first line, uh, to, 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 to see and to analyze all these issues. Uh, we will give uh, uh, investors and corporates to prepare a, a response to the consultation of the European Commission on the EFRAG and ISSB accounting standards. Uh, it is more than uh, crucial to try to elaborate a consensus between corporates and investors on all these issues, and it was uh, what Paris Europlas is trying to do. And now I am very uh, happy to welcome uh, Patrick Pouyanné, uh, CEO uh, of uh, Total, and uh, Laurent Mignon, uh, CEO of uh, BPCE, to uh, precisely uh, have a dialogue between corporates and the financial sector. Thank you very much to all of you, and have a nice day.